Yes, welcome everyone to Q Talks, a podcast series by QTech, the Cambridge University Technology and Enterprise Club. I'm Edward. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q Talk. I'm Yingbo. We will be your hosts for the fireside chat today. Please post your questions for Dr. Kef Lee in the chat box, and we will pick them up. Today, we are talking to Dr. Kai Fu Lee, the chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a leading Chinese technology venture capital firm. Kai Fu was the founder of Microsoft Research Asia and president of Google China. Dr. Lee is also the author of AI Superpowers, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling book. He obtained his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in the US. So hi, Kai Fu. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, hi, Edward. Hi, Yingbo. Thanks for inviting me. Great to be here again. It's a pleasure and privilege for us indeed. Maybe to start our dialogue today, could you share a bit more about how your journey in AI started and how you ended up leading Innovation Ventures? Uh, sure. Uh, I first got in touch with AI uh, just about exactly 40 years ago, um, when I was two. Uh, no, when I was a freshman in college. And I just thought this was the most exciting thing, you know, writing pro I've been writing programs in high school, but I just saw that there, there are these people working on natural language and computer vision. And, and that these things through perception followed by cognition would be the thing that helps us understand ourselves. So I thought this would be it for me. So that, there, that's how I began. Uh, I was fortunate to have uh, two professors, a uh, uh, natural language professor, uh, Michael Leibowitz, who was Roger Sank's student, and uh, John Kender, who was a uh, Takeo Kanadi student from Columbia, who, who taught me, uh, even during my undergraduate years in the early 80s, uh, computer vision and natural language. And after that, they both made me apply to their graduate schools, and I got two offers. I ended up going to Carnegie Mellon, uh, where I worked on speech recognition. I thought at the time vision would be too hard. It's three dimensional, it's got movement and all that. Speech is more two dimensional, more manageable. And it turns out that, that was right. And I was able to find a, a particular machine learning algorithm that delivered the best results back then. Um, and, and many thought that was the first working uh, speaker independent speech recognition system. Uh, uh, that was my PhD thesis. After that, I went to work at Apple I manage speech and natural language, and later multimedia and video and virtual reality for Apple. Then uh, at SG, I went to SGI for two years. Um, and then I went to Microsoft, started the Microsoft Research, which was all about AI. Uh, but at the time, we made a very important strategic decision. We wouldn't call ourselves AI because at that time, this was this was 19, um, this was 19, um, wait, wait, 1988. Uh, no, 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 um, sorry, 19, 19, 1998. Uh, it was a time when AI had a very bad name. Uh, you know, we had a joke that everything that uh, worked was called product. Um, everything that could be demo is called engineering. Everything that didn't work and couldn't demo is called our AI. So we couldn't afford to let Bill Gates down and call ourselves an AI lab. So we called ourselves Microsoft Research. We created uh, departments called, you know, natural language processing and computer vision, computer graphics. So normal sounding things, but we were really doing AI. And then we um, just um, uh, serendipitously, we trained over the last 21 years. Uh, actually, yesterday was the um, anniversary founding of Microsoft Research China. Uh, over the 21 years, we trained um, uh, 5,000 people in AI. And that's what I think partially made China into an AI superpower. And then I went back to Microsoft headquarters. Then I started Google. Um, this was all not too much AI. And then, uh, then I founded Sinovation Ventures in 2009. And the first few years, we invested in the mobile internet and education. Um, and then uh, we made our first AI investment about eight years ago. And about five years ago, we said we're going to all in AI. So um, that's how I got into how I finally uh, reconnected to my love artificial intelligence with my job, which is venture capital um, in now investing in AI. We are uh, very uh, lucky to have invested in seven AI unicorns uh, and starting with series A. Uh, so these all returned you know, 50X, 100X. Uh, so we did quite well in AI, probably 
more AI unicorns uh, than any other VC in the world. And um, we're really enjoying now seeing AI going to the next phase. So that's me and AI. Okay, thanks a lot for your sharing, Kefu. So today, our first topic will be on the entrepreneurship in China. So you have debunked many misconceptions about how entrepreneurs in China are like in your book, AI Superpowered. Could you please elaborate on some of those misconceptions and perhaps compare the similarity and differences between Silicon Valley and China? Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> So I think a perception of China was formed maybe 10 to 20 years ago that most of the Chinese websites and apps were created, uh, inspired by American apps and websites, which is absolutely true. Uh, uh, Google inspired Baidu, Amazon inspired Alibaba and so on and so forth. Uh, actually eBay inspired the Alibaba uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that created an impression in the West that China was just a copycat. That may have been true 10 or 12 years ago, but a, mir a miracle happened in the last 10 years. That is the large market in China uh, attracted a lot of venture capital like us to invest in really smart, hardworking entrepreneurs who are tenacious and played in a winner take all game, very differently from Silicon Valley. I can get into that later if you like. And that created powerful um, internet companies and mobile companies that, that build more products and attracted more people online. And that circle continued to move uh, because China has 1.3 billion people and the mobile internet was growing from, you know, when we got involved, like less than a million people were in smartphones 11 years ago and a hundred million were getting added every year. So imagine that kind of a dividend coming from huge population increase and companies could enjoy huge growth because there were more people coming online. There were behaviors being shaped and, and, and also very fortunately, uh, mobile companies could build a product and build the minimal viable product and, and, and do A-B tests and figure out what users want and pivot towards an amazing product. So it's very true that um, I think the average Chinese researcher or engineer or entrepreneur is probably not as breakthrough innovative as someone from Stanford or Cambridge. <clears throat> However, we no longer required a Steve Jobs to come up with the iPhone and uh, secretly build it in three years and shock the world. Now it is possible with internet full connectivity to use big data and to launch software products to let people try different options and then tweak your product and pivot your product until it was perfect. What was required for such a product to be built is a fast growing market, lots of capital to support your work and the right entrepreneur needs to be hardworking, tweaking everything, asking all the questions, iterating, and then finding new opportunities as the market grows to build a very powerful company. So that was what happened. And if we now look at the most powerful companies in China, uh, obviously Tencent, Alibaba are at the same level as Amazon and uh, Facebook and Google, but also at the next tier, there are a bunch of companies from China, even faster than in the US, companies like uh, Meituan, the delivery company is $200 billion and financial probably would have been 400 billion. IPO got slowed down, but still worth 400 billion. I think ByteDance, very amazing company, uh, owner of TikTok is probably worth 250 billion or so. And Pinduoduo also several hundred billion, JD, and the list goes on. And, and so China has evolved from being a copycat and using the formula I described, building, evolved into companies that were amazingly powerful, amazingly quickly in five to seven years, these com companies came started with nothing and, and benefit from all that. The last point I wanna make is that once these companies became powerful with their 500 million daily active or more, they were able to use AI to further their business, find new opportunities, tweak the features, win the users, maximize the you know, user minutes and so on and so forth. So now there are many giant companies. So when we talk about, you know, I talked about seven AI unicorns. Unicorns are tiny companies now compared to these, you know, $250 billion 
ByteDance, which was only, I think, less than seven years old. So China has become a brand new model of um, company building with a very different style, with amazing success. So when people think about Silicon Valley, uh, yes, we all admire Silicon Valley for uh, Apple and um, um, you know uh, Intel and Tesla and SpaceX um, and all these um, uh, pure tech companies that are breakthroughs. But China has built a new model that can iterate and build a huge company uh, based on the new mobile internet data plus AI. And that's something to learn from. No longer should people regard China as a copycat and look down upon them, but people should look at this as a parallel, equally valuable model of innovation and entrepreneurship to the US. People in business school should study China in parallel to the US. It doesn't mean you should like it more or follow its footsteps, but it would mean it, you would be remiss if you think Silicon Valley was the only model of entrepreneurship. That's very interesting, Kaifu. Um, I really like especially the idea of um, you know, exploring the new model that China has bring in, the more agile approach, if I were to use that term correctly. Yeah. Maybe as a follow-up question, how do you then make use of this knowledge uh, to you know, sort of filter down companies that you would invest in within innovation ventures? Uh, yeah, because the whole um, ecosystem is so dynamic, um, we are always evolving. There are some things that are always fundamentally true, right? It, entrepreneurship is always about the people. And in the China environment, we want people who are very deep and in love and expert in the area they're building a company, uh, not just someone who wants to make a quick profit. And, and we also want someone um, who is a great leader because in this pivoting process, there will be ups and downs. Uh, there will always be disasters one has to deal with. So someone who can lead the company through thick and thin, even when you're running out of cash, you can motivate your team. That skill set, I think, is very important. Uh, ability to learn and grow is very important because think about how fast, right? ByteDance had this 20-something entrepreneur. Uh, in seven years later, he's managing an empire with uh, four IPOs he's working on and worth $250 billion in aggregate. So we want to look for people who have that upward mobility and potential and inclination and ability and willingness and passion to learn. So that's about the people. But we as Sinovation don't have one formula. Our formula, uh, you know, uh, unlike normal companies like you know, IBM or Microsoft or Google, uh, you build a corporate structure. You have one proposition, you keep it going. The idea is to build something that lasts, uh, even if the people change, because the machinery will keep running, right? The, even if all Google management team changed, their ads will still bring in revenue. They have to perfect their business. The venture capital business is very different because we need to reinvent ourselves all the time. What it takes to succeed investing in mobile internet is very different than what it takes for B2B or retail or education or AI. Even within a field like AI, it changes dramatically. Uh, when we invested in AI eight years ago, we were looking for uh, exactly that person with that rocket science um, capability who managed deep learning. And there were only very few of them. And then we kept going for the rocket scientists. Then quickly, when there were th uh, thousands of such people, we wanted people who also had a business acumen or who had a partnership who could build business solutions. But now we think that biggest opportunity in AI is actually the lowest hanging fruit is not he who has the most, the best scientists, but the company that has the best data. So we're looking for companies in any domain, hardware, software, traditional, non-traditional, but they have magical data. And that data can bring outsized returns for the company. Uh, so we're always, uh, we need to be extremely agile. If entrepreneurs need to be agile, VCs also need to be agile. VCs who depend on the same formula or the same playbook are destined to fail when the environment changes. Uh, just now, you mentioned the great leader in the startup. Then how do you and the innovation company decide the property of the great leader for a startup when you go to invest? Oh, sorry, I think I answered that one in the previous question. That's the, the, the passion leader who is able to learn quickly and deal with um, 
problems and, and become a trusted leader even in the, in the toughest times. That I think is uh, uh, unchanged, whether you're doing early stage or mid stage or late stage, whether you're doing education, AI or uh, retail, it's always the same. We all, it's, all, it's all about the people. Uh, but the earlier the stage, the more the people matters. Yeah, th thanks for shedding some lights and insights on that, Kaifu. So previously you mentioned that, uh, you know, once we move on beyond the early stage, once companies have expanded, there are now a lot of very large companies in China. You mentioned like $250 billion companies. They could now afford to explore AI and use it in their own company. Now, in the next topic, we will move to the next section, which is on research and commercialization of AI. We'll try to dissect this technology both from the academic side and also from the industrial uh, perspective. Maybe as a beginning, I know you've mentioned a bit about how we had AI winter in the 1990s, for some people who are aware of that term. Could you give a brief overview of how AI research landscape has changed? especially recently, and where are we heading to in terms of research? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think one uh, very big change is the whole world is fully connected and ideas become instantaneously uh, spreads all over the world. Think about when, you know, let's think about the two biggest breakthroughs on top of uh, deep learning. One is convolutional neural networks. And that was actually um, uh, uh, Jan LeCun's work 30 years ago. But it took 30 years for it to finally reach the mainstream and the masses, um, because you know in the beginning it didn't work that well. But then people found out it didn't work well because the machines were too slow. Uh, GPUs it would work well. Then they found more tricks of how to tune it. Then people didn't believe it, and Jeff Hinton had to send students to Microsoft and Facebook uh, to prove it, and, and Google to prove it, and then. Uh, People read papers and they were still weren't sure. There are lots of data sets. Anyway, it took 30 years from the publication of the paper to it being used by virtually every computer vision company in the world. But take another example, uh, the use of uh, Transformer, right? Transformer, BERT, GPT, all the same similar class of technology that essentially added attention to natural language processing. Now, this technology was effectively invented two and a half years ago by the folks at Google. They published it, but nowadays they don't publish on journal or conference paper. They publish on the internet archives. The moment they published, they had results. So people believed them. Then everybody started building them. And, and we built, when people didn't believe in the results, they challenged and the author would have to prove by uh, sharing the code or at least the data. So the internet, um, and the archival form of publication has in real time connected academia with product companies. So that today, I'm not aware of any product company that isn't already building transformers into their natural language products, whether it's a search engine or a spell checker or, what, or, or, or Gmail, a prediction or what have you. So we've gone from, a, took 30 years to productize something, now it's two years. So I think we are now really, um, um, uh, full speed ahead uh, with this uh, ability to, to use the technology. Also uh, related to that, um, a back five years ago or 10 years ago, a young Lacun is hugely differentiated from everybody else because nobody, hardly anybody understood this stuff. Nowadays, of course, he's still, you know, brilliant and all that. But if you want to build a product, you really don't need a brilliant uh, researcher anymore. You can hire any one of a million people. There are virtually a million AI engineers in China. And, and you know, um, so the ability to apply this is, um, is the here and now. So we're very excited. Uh, and we think the most um, powerful thing will be traditional companies will begin to use AI and reap the greatest value, especially when, if they have data. Yes. Thanks, Kai Fu. So there, there are a few very interesting pointers that you have brought up and we'll follow up on that after this. But perhaps mm -hmm. the first one that I would like to personally ask is that if we focus on deep learning for the time being, uh, researchers have generally understood and agreed that deep learning are basically black box models and that it's very hard for humans to interpret the model's output. What does the neural network weights mean? Yeah. So what is your general opinion on this and whether this would affect the commercialization aspect of AI? Yeah, um, 
so inherently AI is hard to explain um, because you know the these neural networks are more complex than the way we think, um, and uh, the 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 reason that the neural networks made the decision to turn the car this way, or diagnose this person as having lymphoma stage three is based on interactions of thousands of parameters uh, whose mathematical interactions are too complex for humans to comprehend. So it, it, it isn't because it's a black box, it's terrible, but because it's inherently more complex than our ability to comprehend. But having said that, there are many applications for which if you don't explain, uh, people won't use you, right? If you're gonna apply be a healthcare app or autonomous vehicles, for sure, you'll have to, or to be used in justice systems, um, in sentencing assistant, it's actually one of the products that's out there, uh, you better explain yourself. So there, I think there are uh, very good research being, being built in on explainability. Uh, one approach is to change the inherent structure of the neural net so that it's automatically explainable. The other is to leave the neural nets alone, but having ways to find the equivalent of you know, pr principal component analysis or uh, uh, discriminant analysis to pick the most prominent feature combinations and attempt to explain it at a level that people can understand. Um, I think both approaches could work and, and I think we would have to work on it because people would demand an, an explanation and deserve to know. But, but I, I do think more people should understand, especially people in the audience here, that it isn't out of laziness that um, AI scientists um, don't have explainability built in. It's, it's pretty hard. And also understand that ultimately, when the proxim answers are provided, it is in some sense um, a more intelligent being dumbing down the answer to humor us, the humans. <laughs> That's a pretty extreme way to put it. Uh, I don't mean AI is more intelligent in any, in any general ways. I just mean AI is uh, better than us in making judgments on single domain large data questions. And in that sense, it is more intelligent than us in that narrow sense. And it's just too bad we're not as smart so we can fully understand the reasoning. But it is OK if they dumb it down to way, you know, why didn't I get the loan? Oh, because your income is $2,000 too low and you live in an area that is high risk and you only bought your house six months ago and you have a large mortgage. The person would say, OK, I understand. Thank you. But actually, the AI system is laughing Oh, it's so much more than that. But I did my best to explain it in a way that you can understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, Kaifu, that makes sense. I especially agree on your comment that it is not out of laziness that AI researchers like us don't, you know, are not, uh, could not explain the models perfectly yet. And for people who are based in Cambridge, um, I think there are also a lot of ongoing research within the university, especially in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, where we look at things like explainability, bias, and et cetera for AI. So this is a very interesting research topic indeed. So I guess for the next part, we'll ask a bit about uh, policy. Maybe Yingpo, you could take on. Yeah. Just now in the chat box, it's mentioned that China has a five years plan for the AI. So similarly, AI has the, the structural part for many countries policy now. So policy wise, what do you think a country needs to embrace AI, both in research and the commercialization? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think for any product or any technology, we should generally let the market economy figure things out and take care of it. I'm a strong believer in that. Um, we don't need the government to meddle with to make a technology take off. What the government can do is provide a powerful infrastructure on things that we commercially cannot possibly do. So as an example, uh, take autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're struggling to get L5 autonomous vehicle out there because uh, it's a complicated domain, in which case there are too many long tail conditions for us to train to a level that the autonomous vehicle drives better than people in most circumstances. So how do we cross that bridge? Well, one way to cross it is what if the government is willing to modify the highways or the city roads so that they can work symbiotically with the cars so that the cars um, harm fewer lives 
so that they can be launched. And once they launch, they'll collect more data and become better, right? So the question is, how do we get the initial thing going? So no company can afford to build a new highway and certainly not a new city, right? An example would be um, one of the Chinese cities is experimenting with putting cars at um, uh, one level and, and pedestrians at another level. So that will guarantee that no car will hit a pedestrian, which is the worst case of all accidents. So maybe by building that, it's good enough to push the technology over the edge, right? So I think, I think those are the good policies that are pro AI and smart to do. Um, another type of, um, another type of um, uh, that has worked well in China is uh, called um, uh, guided funds, which means uh, it's, it's very dangerous for governments to pick winners. Um, mo many governments have tried and, and mostly they fail because governments, people, officials are good at what they do. They're not trained to be investors. We are professional investors. So one way that governments can incent more AI is by becoming an LP, that is an investor in funds that do the right types of investments. So let's say a country, uh, UK, China, US, wants to have more, let's say, um, 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 AI medical uh, uh, diagnosis, hypothetically, let's say that was really important. Well, then the government can fund VCs. Say, if you invest in those companies, I will be your LP for every such investment you make. When you make money for me, I'll give my profit back to you. So those are kind of very smart um, uh, guided funds, which Israel, Singapore, uh, and China have taken. That's another type. And of course, the third area that's important is basically the, the, the rules, the rules and regulations and guide, guidelines, uh, whether it's GDPR in Europe or um, you know, punishing people for selling users' data or establishing uh, basis of uh, ethical use of AI um, or punishing people who use AI to achieve um, evil purposes. So these are also things that government can do. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Kaifu. I think that addresses some of the questions that have been written down in the chat box about the need for regulation versus free market. I, I believe that you personally firmly believe that I guess free market is the way to go. Having more venture capitalists embedded in a, com uh, in a country can only bring benefits than disadvantages. Yeah. So, um, well, I guess one other question that we wanted to ask is you mentioned before that uh, research in computer science is unique in a sense that recent results are published openly in archive basically for free it's a bit different with the typical approach that we had like publishing in a journal which could take a few months so do you have any comments on that especially because everyone now from all over the world could access archive or even like your software sphinx for example we were talking about this earlier today that thing is basically now available in GitHub. I could download it from anywhere. I don't even need to have a deep knowledge in AI to implement that. How could then a government or a company differentiate itself from the competition? Well, it's the same thing as um, uh, open source. I think it's an open source at a higher level, uh, just like you know, companies can build on Linux and, and make money, right? Android was built on Linux. So you just have to pick your commercial application to make sure that your product is more um, solid, faster, better, bright features, or, or solves the problem for a particular industry. Um, but the, the, the core uh, technologies are shared. So I think the open source community, whether it's Linux or GitHub, uh, I think provides a wonderful um, foundation uh, for uh, commercial companies to build on top of that. And I would like to think the academic um, community can, can do the same. Yep, and I think indeed in, in several strands of research, having that public knowledge might be useful in a sense. There are ongoing research topics like transfer learning, I believe where if you have access to pre-trained models, you could benefit. Uh, so the model will now benefit humanity in general because you now have more data that you can access to. Right. And I believe, right. oh, sorry, yeah. And, and I believe uh, you mentioned something about transfer learning and GPT-3 being some of the more interesting breakthrough these days, maybe for the benefit of our audience today, if you could explain a bit about what these technologies are. 
Sure. Um, there was a very interesting paper and a demonstration called GPT-3 that came out of OpenAI. Um, I guess one could view them as the challenger to DeepMind, if you will, in an academic sense. They're both uh, very smart people. Uh, they showed a lot of things that we didn't think before were possible. For example, um, the idea is that you would train a pre-trained model on, on unbelievable amount of data, basically every text you can scrounge in the world and train a model. And from that model, you can tune it for specific domains with a small amount of data. So it's sort of like a child who learns the linguistic skills. And then on top of that linguistic skill, the child could learn chemistry or poetry or music. So it works somewhat similarly. Um, so, so in a lot of demonstrations, uh, people are really wowed by the ability that uh, this could converse at a cross domain level with some intelligence and attention models that sh shows at levels that people didn't think were before possible. Now, of course, it also comes with a lot of problems. You know, it, it talks a lot of nonsense uh, at times, and it doesn't know when to stop, and it doesn't know what it doesn't know. It's got a lot of problems, but the general model of training a giant model um, and then using it to tune for specific tasks seems like a valid way to go. And, and, and they train the training model in a basically an unsupervised way uh, without telling it this is X or Y or Z. They basically use past text to predict future texts. So I think those are very in interesting ideas and they may extend beyond natural language into images, video and other forms of media. So that's the power. There is, um, so there is uh, one big upside potentially and one big downside potentially. The upside is that this might be the first thing that in AI that looks like a platform to me. Anything before that was just a bunch of modules you could take and plug it into your engine or your platform, right? Salesforce can plug it in and call it Einstein. Microsoft can plug it in and call it, um, you know, whatever, um, call it uh, Xiaobing or whatever, Xiao Ice. Um, but, um, uh, but now you've got maybe a big platform because you this giant pre-trained model maybe is the platform on which APIs can be built. And that's what in fact OpenAI was trying to do. But also has a big downside because before anybody could take AI module and plug it in and you can run it on a PC. If you have a larger machine, you run faster. Now you need this. Now, if you want your own giant model, it takes $5 million to train each time. So suddenly it puts a big distance from the giants like Google, uh, Microsoft, um, DeepMind uh, from the rest of us, you know, smaller companies and universities. So that brings some issues as well. Um, and also just to cl clarify, I do not believe um, GPT-3 is uh, anything close to general intelligence. It is just a really smart and important step that might make large pre-training a way to make practical tuning into specific domains. Yes, thanks for clarifying that, Kaifu. There's a question from the audience related to GPT-3, I think from Minji. Uh, she was asking about uh, OpenAI opening and releasing API for GPT-2, but not for GPT-3. She asked if, is this a worrying trend that as soon as companies become successful, they stop being open? Uh, I'm afraid it is a tautology. It's always true that when companies become successful, they stop being open. Um, take as an example, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's a smart business practice. So what I'm not sure what we can do about it. Think about Microsoft at the time with a closed phone system. And Google came in and said, hey, Android is open, Android is free, use ours, we'll tweak everything up, don't use Windows. And they short defeated Microsoft because they suddenly made free available and open a new way to build great phones. But guess what? Once Google became successful, they started you know, requiring that you put Google managed services and all that, and you end up using the code, which may be free, but the certification costs money, the licensing costs money, and then they make money from YouTube, Gmail, Google search, and many other things. So I think uh, when companies become listed in our capitalistic system, uh, they will have a tendency to choose whatever makes more money and opening being open is a good way to grab a leadership position. Being free is also good for that. But once you have that leadership position, being closed will sometimes make you the most money. So we just have to hope 
that technology moves so quickly that there will be a new challenger that once Android starts creating its ecosystem, makes its money, someday will have an opportunity to build something that's open that takes them away. And probably inevitably that something will become closed again, then something will have to open it up. I think that's just the natural course of um, capitalism driven technology development. It's we're lucky that we're not back in the age of oil and automobiles when it's hard to um, break open closed systems. Nowadays, it's just software. So I'd like to think um, uh, open, open system that become closed and profitable can be challenged and will be challenged in a matter of years, not even decades. Thank you very much for the comments on the technology and the policy. We will go to the final session. The relationship be between AI and humans. I know you are very concerned about the AI induced crisis of job displacement. You have a framework of AI and human coexistence blueprint. Can you please elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, there's a more com complex version in my book, so I'll give you the short version. If you like it, you can buy my book, okay? Um, the question to ask is, uh, can AI do the job of many people? That's the general question people ask. Uh, first, I want people to break it down into not, not replacing people, but replacing tasks that people do. You know, a, for example, a receptionist. Can AI do a better job for many parts of a receptionist? Checking identity, checking in, printing the badges, tracking people, making sure they leave on time. And of course they can. But can AI become a welcoming, warm, smiling face to the visitor? Of course not. So the job of a receptionist cannot be fully replaced, um, but can be the, some of the tasks that re receptionists do can be replaced. Um, but does it cause a job displacement? It does, because imagine you have a big company with 10 receptionists. Now, if AI is doing half of the work they do, there will only be a need for five receptionists going forward, right? So it does absolutely cause um, reduction. Um, and yes, um, AI symbiotically combined with a humanistic receptionist is a great combination, but don't believe people who tell you that this just makes us better and doesn't replace jobs. It makes receptionists um, more humanistic and more warm and welcoming. It does do that, but that's the five that remain that have a job, not the five that got replaced. So there is no way that AI can uh, be said to have no impact on jobs. Um, so what jobs, so AI is, um, can, can do basically routine tasks by training on a lot of data. And so the more routine someone's work, the more likely it's gonna get replaced. Uh, but maybe another way to ask the question is, what are some deep human capabilities that cannot be replaced by AI? And that will give us a blueprint of how we work with AI. And I think there are generally two types of things. The first is creativity, but it also includes um, strategic thinking, analytical skills, common sense, multi-domain reasoning, uh, knowing what you don't know, knowing why, asking why, asking smart questions. These are one set of cognitive skills that uh, people have that AI can approximate sometimes, but generally not do nearly as good a job. AI is much better at a well-defined problem, given a well-defined problem, optimizing for a equation or a solution. Okay, so that's kind of one, one dimension. The other dimension of what AI cannot do is hum, human touch. Um, we really um, uh, require you know, connections to humans. So human touch, human connections, people showing warmth and uh, caring, compassion and empathy. Um, you know, people talked about can AI become elderly care? Maybe some of the tasks AI can do, but large, uh, I don't know of any older person who doesn't want to be cared by another human. You just don't, don't want the robot to do that. So, so that's another dimension is uh, uh, a lot of compassion, empathy, human touch, trust, and bring the warm feeling to you. So now we've divided the space into four quadrants. So first there are these low compassion, low creativity things, things like um, uh, assembly line and um, you know, fast food restaurant chef um, and, and, and um, uh, telemarketer, uh, 
people will call you and say the same thing every time. Those will be replaced uh, completely over time. Okay, so let's not have any false expectations about that. Uh, again, moving up the jobs that may not be incredibly creative, but um, do require human touch. Maybe uh, jobs like um, nurse and elderly care and um, um, volunteers at foster homes and uh, concierge and tour guides. Uh, these jobs will absolutely still require a human to do it, but maybe they can have AI assist them. Right. If you're in concierge, maybe AI can be a tool that figures out uh, what are the best paths for a tourist who comes to town. But you would deliver it in a you know wonderful uh, you know uh, English concierge kind of way, right? That that people really love to have that cannot be replaced by AI. So that's a symbiotic combination. Then moving to the lower right is the um, highly creative tasks that don't necessarily have a lot of human touch. So scientists, uh, financial analysts trying to analyze a company or an industry. So these are jobs um, that are driven by people with their creativity, but they too can also use AI as an analytical tool. It, imagine a, someone working on drug discovery with AI trying to figure out which drugs are most likely to pass you know, human trials or someone working on an investigative journalism that with AI fetching a lot of evidence for the reporter, that too would be a symbiotic combination. And of course, finally, there are jobs that require both creativity uh, as well as well as um, uh, human touch. Then of course, those would be human centric jobs, but still the AI tools can come into play. So overall in this um, uh, coexistence um, blueprint, uh, there will be jobs AI will take. There will be jobs that will, are coexisting. So what people should do uh, is to really think about how, if you're already, if someone you know is in the quadrant that's uh, targeted for being replaced, then if to the extent they can move to the creativity direction, that's great. If not, then really service jobs with a lot of human touch is kind of the direction to go. It also finally suggests for education, uh, we should stop teaching our children uh, or those of us who have children or grandchildren going to school, uh, stop wasting all the time with rote learning and memorization uh, because we will never beat AI at that or optimization. We may need to have those skill set as foundation, but schools need to start teaching uh, creativity, curiosity, um, critical thinking. Schools need to teach um, uh, empathy and compassion and teamwork, ability to communicate and win trust from people. So education really does need to be rethought. And I think if we're able to help people who are displaced find jobs, retrain them, and um, update our education system to train the right skill sets, we will actually end up in a much, much better place. Because can you imagine a new world that we live in, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, where everything you do are things that you love? You no longer have to do routine jobs. Can you imagine humanity being uh, fully liberated from ever having to do routine repetitive tasks. Then we have all the time in the world to think about things we love, things we're good at, and um, figuring out the future of humanity, thinking about deep thoughts, or just enjoying yourself. So I think ultimately this will be a phenomenal thing. But next 20, 30 years, we got to figure out how to help those who are displaced, find a new beginning, and how to update our education system to prepare us for a better world. Thank you, Kaifu. I think that remark on education is very interesting. Maybe could you elaborate a bit more on that, uh, and taking into account the recent pandemic that has been happening and now that people are all moving online, has your perspective changed and what could we do now on to make sure that we update our education system? Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, COVID is obviously a disaster for, the, for all of mankind, uh, but there is a silver lining around the dark cloud which is that it's accelerated online behavior, habit changing and data gathering. So that, you know, lectures like this one before, people would generally not accept. Now people are embracing it. So I think it's a great thing. And any, anytime we go online, we go digital, we have data. Anytime we have data, we can apply AI. So I think there's a huge opportunity for education to be built on top of this new online way of education. 
um, this includes, think about the process of a teacher teaching a classroom of kids. Um, part of that teacher's job can be done better than AI when it's delivered online. So you can think about um, what are things you can do online that you can't do offline? Well, we can give every student a different test, test right? If you know some students are still stuck on multiplication, others are moving on to exponents, well, you can have a medium-sized class, but give them different tests to keep challenging the ones who are advanced and then making sure the ones who are falling behind are able to catch up on their foundational work. Um, the other thing you can do is make the, why, if you can make the content customized, right? Obviously you can give homework and tests in, a, in an individualized targeted way, um, but why not make the teacher also individualized and targeted? Now you can have different teachers and tutors uh, matching the right kind of teacher to the students. But, but why, why not, why stop there? Why can't we have a virtual teacher? If, especially for younger kids, right? Imagine a three-year-old, wouldn't they be much rather be taught by their favorite cartoon character than a human talking head on the other side, right? So those are also opportunities that are added on, on top of that. Um, and, um, and, and we're not trying to move all of education online, but in, at Silovation Ventures, uh, actually we've invested in as many education companies as we have on AI companies. And we also have achieved comparable returns. And um, uh, so what we have realized is that the teaching as a profession can be revamped if we think about it as an online and offline merging so that things that need to happen offline, like teaching dancing, you know, um, teaching swimming, needs to happen offline in the real world. However, practice can still happen using online. And there are some things that can be taught online, but practice um, offline and vice versa. They need to be combined. And that teachers, you know, um, teachers are uh, great teachers are a very scarce resource. They should be shared. And online, they can be shared much more. Uh, for example, a brilliant teacher who lectures and is fun and and people love it and understand things faster. They can teach a thousand kids online, um, but 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 the kids are not in one giant thousand person classroom. But they might be in a hundred smaller classrooms of ten with a teaching assistant giving hands on help. So and so we're figuring out all these smart ways of combining you know super teachers with um, average teachers with online and offline covering all subjects, uh, divvying up the job of a teacher. Uh, from those that can be done by AI and those that must be done by a human. So um, it's really exciting because, uh, you know, people talk about uh, reinventing education. I think doing it in an um, existing institution is extremely hard because, you know, the two things that are hardest, hardest, maybe, maybe there's more than two, but two of the hardest things to change are religion and uh, education, right? Because it takes, you know, maybe a few hundred years to get religion right. It takes maybe you know hundred years to get education right. People are hesitant to tweak it because if you tweak it, you don't see the results until kids graduate and go, go into go into business. So so all the ministers of education are very very conservative and cautious. So dreaming to to revolutionize the education system in any country is unimaginable. But here we are in China with parents willing to pay lots of money for education in extracurricular sense because. The Chinese parents have, you know, saved a lot of money and they have one child mostly and they want the best for their children. They're willing to spend. And now they still go to the schools, which can hardly be changed, but everything outside the school can be new and can be capitalistically driven. So there's a huge competition in China for online, online, offline, offline outside the school system teaching and learning. And I'm seeing amazing results. The kids are getting higher scores, increased interactivity, new ideas are coming up. Not only are there virtual teachers, there are now virtual students interacting in the classroom. And, and the students are virtually AI generated with one goal in mind, which is in, increase interactivity by the students. So they become more engaged. So I am seeing that our path towards revolutionizing education for the sake of AI displacement and whatever other reasons that may require education to change. I don't see any government changing the education system. And I think we have an opportunity in the private sector to change it from the private side 
Because once we do that, the governments will say, oh, wow, this is so advanced. I'll adopt this, I'll adopt that. Um, but without the uh, extracurricular outside the normal school as an experimental platform, that the governments will never have the, the initiative on their own to, to, to revolutionize education. To them, the risks will always be too high. But now we've got this opportunity. So we're very lucky to be at the confluence of AI and education um, here. Thanks for a lot. I have more question about the online education in China market. Uh, uh, currently in China, there are many famous K-12 online education companies, uh, brands, like for example, VIP Kids, uh, Yuan Fu Dao, and so on. So then do you think if there is more opportunity for the newcomers in the online education market in China? Uh, well, there, there is, um... I think education is a little bit similar to uh, to the to the um, apps. Uh, once you have a really 800-pound gorilla, uh, they control the entry point of a lot of kids. So it does give a um, um, inordinate advantage to the education companies that are larger. Uh, however, there are many ways to still get in at this stage because education isn't a one-size-fits-all. There is a one-to-one, -one, small classroom, large classroom, one teacher, two teacher, dual teacher, and then there's different um, uh, subjects. And then there is uh, also classes designed for you to score higher grades and classes designed for you to develop creative thinking or programming or piano or art. So there are many, many entry points and there are different ways to come by, combine online, offline. So I think while there are several 800 pound gorillas created, there are still many other opportunities. And in terms from, a, so we talked about education in an idealistic sense. Let's talk about it from a business sense. Um, it's effectively, if I run an education business, uh, I'm dealing with the business that has two major costs. Uh, one is the cost of student acquisition. That's really expensive. That could be several hundred dollars to acquire a student if you do it the normal advertising way. Um, and then the other is basically the cost of the teacher or the cost of the teacher and the courses. So to run a good education system, if, if you can uh, reduce the acquisition cost of your students and um, uh, reduce the cost of your course and teacher, but still make it attractive so that you achieve a, a, re a retention rate of over 80%, then you've got a cycle going. So. Uh, so companies are playing with different unit economics and trying different models. To give you one example, you know, one of the entrepreneurs was looking for a way to start an education company to teach the kids something fun, but make the most money at it. Then they study, you know, what about if you teach Go versus um, music versus piano versus singing versus dancing versus this and that. And then they did, they basically checked out all the economics by studying offline schools. And then they found um, that actually it turns out dancing, um, especially street dancing for boys, achieves the highest level of profitability because it's incredibly attractive, fairly easy to acquire customers. And um, uh, it's an offline plus online experience. And the teacher can actually teach more kids uh, in the per classroom. So this kind of become, so if you're an entrepreneur who's determined to do online education uh, in China or anywhere, don't fixate yourself into one thing. Be open-minded and study. And in this particular case, they found a great model that uh, the unit economics were wonderful and that they're now opening up um, uh, stores um, in a lot of places in China. So I, I just think it's, it's um, not a done, uh, not at, we're not at the end game that there are still many, many entry points and the unit economics can still be tweaked quite a bit. And also education is probably not like social network. Social network is the extreme where it's truly winner take all. Uh, there's no way you can build another Facebook to compete against Facebook or another WeChat to compete against WeChat. You can build esoteric products, but it's really hard to do. But, but in education, I, don't, I think it can, we can have two or three big players left even in any one of the verticals. So I, I don't think it's um, quite as bad as the uh, mobile internet. Thanks a lot, Kai Fu, for all of your insights and great explanations today. So we have unfortunately arrived at the end of today's session. 
perhaps just to close today's talk, do you have any closing remarks for the audience, Kai? Uh, yeah, I think we live really in a very remarkable time when, um, when we are faced with um, uh, all the technologies that we have access to. I think mobile internet has connected the whole world, people together with uh, content and other people. And soon IoT will connect devices together. And I think we're at the beginning of the artificial intelligence revolution. Artificial intelligence is one of the very, very few omni-use technologies that's ever invented. The only earlier ones are the steam engine, electricity, and computer and internet. This is our fourth one. So uh, for those of you who are in school, you're in the perfect timing to enter a world when a general purpose omni-use technology is about to change the world and treasure that opportunity. I'm sure whether you want to start your company or work in a company or teach or do research, this is really the, the best time ever to do that. Thank you a lot, Kefu. It's a really great talk. I believe everyone could learn a lot from your talk today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for speaking at Forum. So everyone, thanks for coming and do attend our next events. Uh, check out our stuff at www.qtech.io. Thanks everyone, have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay.